uh, I ought to differentiate between what I would call the guiding voice of God, the shepherd, and what I would call the interventionary voice of God, uh, the shepherd. There is the guiding influence of the still quiet voice and your God-given conscience. There is the Word of God and the ministry of the Holy Spirit from which we receive revelation in various ways. And the primary purpose of this is to teach us about God, to enlarge our capacity to receive Him, and to assist us to maintain an abiding relationship with Him. That voice can be constant as God gently guides you through life. And it should still be weighed against the word of God. There is, however, something else. There is the interventionary God, uh, interventionary voice of God, where God speaks to us more urgently and dramatically in a way that typically will or should alter the course of our lives. Uh, This voice is less common. In my Christian life, I've heard it perhaps four times. And this general infrequency of this voice, this more apparent and, and, and more audible voice is sometimes distressing for us. We long to hear his voice in a clear, distinct, recognizable way all the time. But this infrequency is for good reason. And the best analogy that I could give is that of a fire alarm. Fire alarms are installed to urgently get your attention warn you of danger, and prompt you to take immediate action. They are specifically for the event of an emergency. Fire alarms are, uh, sorry, fire drills are important, but if you do fire drills too frequently, when the alarm goes off, people roll their eyes and move casually in the assumption that this is not an emergency, this is just a routine drill, right? God does not use his interventionary voice often Because when he does speak to us with this voice, he wants us to respond with urgency, not just roll our eyes and move casually in the assumption that it's not an emergency, it's just a routine drill. Now, I say that because people will all too casually declare, God said this to me, and God said that to me, and God has been made out to be some sort of a celestial chatterbox, prone to mood swings and changes of mind that strangely coincide with your mood swings and your changes of mind. When God is, in fact, more frugal with his words, he is more steady with his mood, and he is more steadfast with his opinion. He speaks less frequently in his interventionary voice, so that when he speaks, we will respond with urgency rather than indifference. The key is this, and if I could sum up everything I've said, the key to discipleship is this. The big point of John chapter 10 is this. If you stay close enough to Jesus to hear frequently his still quiet voice, you will most certainly be close enough to hear his interventionary voice when it's required. And always weigh what you hear against scripture. The big point of John chapter 10 is this, God is faithful to his promise. And he is not like the shepherds of Israel. He's not like that televangelist. He is the good shepherd, and we can trust him. Maybe uh, someone could come. When I stood on that altar that day in front of hundreds of friends and family, onlookers who may as well have not even have been there because my gaze was locked on the woman of my dreams, as I publicly confessed my love to her and my commitment to her, as we began our lifelong journey together, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, I'm not sure if either of us knew entirely what we were getting ourselves into. And perhaps if we had have known, we may not have started. At times, the journey has required of us both separately and together to make tremendous sacrifices. But has it been worth it? Categorically, yes. 
when I stood on that altar that day in front of friends who would soon become family, though at the time they were merely onlookers who may as well have not even have been there, my gaze locked on the Redeemer as I publicly confessed my intention to follow Him all of my days as we began that lifelong journey together, for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health, I'm not sure that I knew entirely what I was getting myself into. And this journey has required of me to make tremendous sacrifices, oftentimes. But has it been worth it? Categorically, yes. When those first disciples left their fishing boats, their fathers, their livelihoods, their lives. I'm not sure that they knew, had any idea how it would finish for them. Simon Peter crucified upside down. Andrew whipped several times and then crucified. James executed by the sword. But if you asked them on their last day, had it been worth it? I'm sure the answer would have been categorically yes, maybe in Greek. Andrew's followers reported that when he was led towards the cross, Andrew saluted it in these words, I have long desired and expected this happy hour. The cross has been consecrated by the body of Christ hanging on it. And history records that he continued to preach to his tormentors for two days until he died. It is very, very unlikely that your life will be asked of you on account of your faith. Very unlikely. But your life will be asked of you. That's what discipleship's all about. Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for me will find it. The word of the Lord. Let's stand for a moment. I appreciate I've gone a little bit over time. I apologize for that transgression. I wonder if you'd close your eyes and lift your hands for a moment and just renew your commitment to him. Redeclare the value made on this altar that day for better or for worse, for richer or for poorer, in sickness and in health. Jesus, we are yours. And we thank you that you are for us. And God, I pray that we would found to be on that day faithful disciples, having surrendered our life, having surrendered what we could not possibly have kept to gain what we cannot possibly lose. And Father, we thank you for the cross. Jesus' name.